Welcome to Bergen Forest Monastery's live stream. I imagine Sona. And let's proceed with the first question, Pia. Ajahn, the first question today is from the live chat from Delini in Sri Lanka. Dear Venerable Sir, in the fourth jhana, characterized by intense concentration, ekagata, how can one direct the mind towards the contemplation of the three marks of existence, anicca, dukkha, anatta, if the state is primarily focused on single-pointedness and devoid of distractions? Well, that's a question that has been asked through history. Uh, the standard answer in the commentaries, at least, is that you can't. You, you, you don't contemplate in the fourth jhana. You, <clears throat> you, you withdraw from the fourth jhana. And the after effects, so the, the mind is purified in the fourth jhana, and then that purification after effect is when you contemplate but you're now back at least to the first jhana. <clears throat> in, in the first jhana, this, these factors, thinking and pondering, in, in Pali, uh, vitaka, vichara, are, um, you're able to, to ponder and, and reflect. But uh, there are other people, other in present times that uh, point out that in the description of the Buddha's first night when, when he, he attains awakening, he also goes into the fourth jhana. And in that fourth jhana, he somehow gets access to a review of his uh, previous lives, <clears throat> a vast inventory of his previous lives. He reflects on the nature of kama, the problems uh, and the, the anicca, which is the impermanence of things and the insubstantiality of all things and including the absence of self. It, it, but in the sutta, it doesn't, see, it doesn't indicate that he has withdrawn from the fourth jhana. So <clears throat> there are some monks, some modern monks apparently, uh, who have suggested that perhaps uh, somehow in the fourth jhana, it, insight is possible to arise. So these are the positions that are that are taken. Uh, this is, if you spend enough time chewing on these kind of uh, issues, what, what become you become very familiar with the all the ingredients of the path and the the stories <clears throat> in the suttas about um, what happens. The fourth jhana for the audience is the is a very deep state of concentration. Uh, you can imagine descending in terms of uh, uh, of deep sea diving or something. You know, if you perhaps the first stage is just getting your head underwater and swimming around. It's a different world. Underwater is a different world, and then the surface, and then some. You dive deeper. You dive to five meters, and then. <clears throat> to 10 meters and to 15 meters. And at 15 meters, everything is suspended. Um, absolute stillness. There is no sense of body, no thought activity, according to the, the descriptions. There is only a sense of equanimity. There is no, it's not particularly joyful at all. It's just a kind of a ethereal uh, evenness. Equanimity is the characteristic of it. So these are the, these are the words that we have. And there's only, to describe each jhana is only a handful of words. <clears throat> Basically, 
most people never enter into these areas of the mind. Most people are, there's a flurry of activity in the mind, quite incoherent. It's almost like a waking dream. All kinds of obtrusive thoughts, random, scattered uh, activity in the mind. So that even the first jhana is the application of some sort of sustained concentration where you stay on a single topic for a period of time, sustained period of time, and, and are very engaged with it. And then uh, in this, the by the third jhana, there is no activity of thought. <clears throat> it's still a delightful, joyful, emotional experience, but uh, there's just a, a lot of tranquility in the fourth jhana, even the, the experience of joy disappears. So <clears throat> it's very difficult to put that together with contemplating the three characteristics. So remember in the question, if your concentration is good, you'll remember how this question started. Did you follow? <laughs> or have you, have you, have you wandered? <laughs> so this person is asking in the fourth jhana, how do you contemplate impermanence, uh, absence of self, and uh, un, the unsatisfactory nature of existence? <clears throat> how do you contemplate that if there's, if there's only this single-pointed uh, concentration? And it seems to be a contradiction there. And, and yet, some would say that somehow it happens. If it happens at all, we can say that it, there's this, the mind absolutely at rest, that it accesses spontaneous uh, uh, understanding. So this is another way to think about it. The notice that sometimes you get brilliant ideas or a memory arises or something new comes up that you're not trying to get. You you're out perhaps in nature, you're you're taking a bath. Remember the famous story of Archimedes taking a bath trying to solve the, the issue of how to <clears throat> determine uh, the volume of a, of a metal. Uh, he, and he got into the bathtub, he noticed that the, the water rose and it, it must have uh, be displacement of his body. And at that moment he said this famous word, Eureka, I get it. <laughs> Where did that thought come from? How did that understanding come from? You know, you, usually in a bath, you, you, you take a, a long bath to relax and just forget about everything. Or if you're out in nature, sitting by a lake, just being quiet, sometimes brilliant thoughts come to you. <clears throat> so they arise out of the stillness of the mind. So if we're going to try to explain this business with the fourth jhana, how understanding could arise in the fourth jhana, without a lot of abst you know, uh, linear thought, then it, it has to be that process. And it arises from a deeper level of the mind. We might say the unconscious level of the mind or the subconscious level of the mind and, and just appears as a full solution to a problem. And the, the access to that full solution is best uh, through silence rather than through thinking about it. So this is if we want to reconcile this idea in the fourth jhana of having a, a sort of enlightened insights come, then that must be the process. But the earlier commentaries say, well, you know, it's it's not possible. The fourth jhana is absolute stillness, so you can't <clears throat> you can't reflect it all in there. So I leave you with those two alternatives just to inform you. I'm not I'm not giving a uh, definitive answer at this point, not solving a, an old, very uh, advanced kind of uh, idea. Uh, I'm not proclaiming uh, the solution to this, just giving you the two 
the two explanations. Yeah. Okay, Pia, let's go on to the next question. Next question from the live chat is from Upasika Mustafa in Iran. In mindfulness of mind, we observe our emotions like anger or sadness. However, I've noticed emotions seem to have two aspects. First, a form that is felt in the body, not mind, that distinguishes one emotion from another. And second, the Vedana. Both anger and sadness are considered dukkha Vedana, but they feel different in the body. It seems like mindfulness of mind might overlap with mindfulness of body and feeling. It is easier for me to consider the four foundations of mindfulness, not as four separate practices, but one whole practice. For example, first a negative emotion f- a negative emotion forms in me. I look at the body and see that this emotion has a special form. Then I notice that this emotion is associated with dukkha. Then I look at sankara. I have this desire to do something to avoid this emotion. In the end, I remember the path and what I should do correctly based on metta and not ill will. Could you offer some guidance? Yeah, uh, that's a good analysis, and that's what happens. The four foundations of mindfulness for the general audience are the first one is the body. The second one is feelings, that is sensations, pleasant, neutral, painful, Third one is the mind, uh, and the mind is described as angry or not, greedy or not, deluded or not, expansive, contracted, um, surpassable or unsurpassable. These are mental states. And then the last category is uh, Dhamma <clears throat> categories, primarily the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment. So these are four <clears throat> foundations of mindfulness, but they include basically all of the five khandas. So you can map the five khandas, the five uh, aspects of a human over top of these. And the first, what is the first of the five khandas is the body. So the first category of four foundations of mindfulness is the body. Second is the feelings. Voila. So we have perfect correspondence. First khanda is body. Second khanda, feelings. The third khanda is divided into perception, consciousness. And then uh, so the the third, fourth, and fifth are, are to do with the mind. So we have in the third <laughs> foundation of mindfulness, we have mindfulness of the mind. And what is the mindfulness of the mind? It's primarily around emotions. So it's anger. Now, anger is both is a volition. So uh, anger doesn't just happen to you. Actually, you you cause it to happen. So that's a volition. That's the the fifth uh, khanda, sankhara. And there is a perception involved in it. Usually that's the trigger for the anger. Perception is unwise attention to the fault. And that triggers a volition. And so now you have perception. And of course you have consciousness. You're, you're conscious of the feeling and you're conscious you can be conscious of it, that it's in the body. So you see that the third and fourth foundations of mindfulness map onto the five khandas. So you're seeing the interconnection of this. And it shouldn't be considered too complicated. When we have, you know, an experience of anger, we feel it through our body. And uh, it involves perception. Uh, it's an old familiar feeling, you know, anger coming to you is something that's happened before. There's memory involved in it. There's re- some sort of uh, initiation of it. There might be a determination to, to recognize it and uh, reduce it. 
or to continue with it, uh, this kind of thing. So it's a very rapid interaction between a number of aspects of the mind, the feelings and the body. It's ricocheting around rapidly. For most people, it's a very chaotic uh, uh, experience, kind of like looking at a bunch of clouds in the sky, you know, weather in the sky, all these cloud shapes. For most people, mm -hmm. it's very just, it's just blobs of something up there. But if you're a meteorologist, you know exactly what those clouds represent and what altitude that they are at and what their function is. It's very clear to you if you're taught this. Most people, I think still in school, they teach you about cirrus clouds and cumulonimbus nimbus clouds. It's fascinating. As a kid, you start, oh my, those clouds are... Suddenly the structure of the sky, which was just an amorphous blob before, starts to have coherence. So it's become possible to understand a little bit. And this is the nature for most people of their own minds. This is what, of course, psychologists will do with people and psychoanalysts. It will start to clarify for people what, what you're thinking and how you're thinking and what happens when you think that way and how it feels about that. So that's a clarification structure of the mind. So this is this primarily this four foundations of mindfulness is a is a psychoanalytic technique for gaining clarity about your body and your feelings and your mind and what happens. So this is uh, this is the case. By the way, the third category of the four foundations of mindfulness is called mindfulness of mind, and and it's then it lists them. You know, my, you're angry or not, greedy or not. But we actually have a really interesting word for that. It's called emotion. They don't have that word in, uh, in the Pali. They separate off mental activities and then the feeling that's connected with the mental activities. And there are long lists of the possibilities of this. So this certain thought arises connected with a feeling and that feeling and thought is combined to, and they call it anger. We have, we just combined it instantly as emotion. So feeling and thought are emotion combined, but there's actually aspects. You can separate out these aspects. You can separate out thoughts from feelings, the, the accompanying feeling. The Buddha points out that anger is, uh, uh, begins with an un, a, a thought directed to a fault. So an unwisely directed thought to a fault, a problem in the world. And then a sensation, a feeling arises with that, a mentally generated feeling arises with that. And by the way, he says always that the feeling is always not pleasant. It's uh, always accompanied by unpleasant sensation. Greed, on the other hand, is sometimes accompanied by unpleasant sensation and sometimes accompanied by pleasant sensation. So we, we start to analyze this um, in a systematic way. The Buddha takes you apart into your various parts so that you're able to understand yourself and then practice in a systematic way to alleviate uh, unskillful mental activities and emotional activities. And that's what that results in enlightenment. Enlightenment meaning that you're free from these self-harassments, ignorance, blundering around in, in negative feelings. That, that, uh, that clear resultant is called enlightenment and it is expressed as seven elements, as seven factors of enlightenment. Um, they're all positive um, elements, joy and ease and stillness, clarity, etc., are the nature of the enlightened mind. So 
one has now skill and is no longer ignorant. One is skillful now, knowledgeable, skillful about one's the act, how how the inner life works. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on to the next question. Next question from the live chat is from Alyssa. Dear Ajahn Sona, I have a question about goodness. I heard in teachings that humility is not taking ownership of our good qualities and that our goodness, when we let go of it, smells sweet. How to begin developing those attitudes? Uh, be careful with that. Um, one of the things that I kind of think characteristic of the Western mind, probably influenced by some forms of Christian ideas uh, is that you're kind of not supposed to be uh, proud of your own goodness or not be, you should be humble about your good deeds and so forth. Buddhism actually encourages you to, to, to re, re-enjoy your, the, your good deeds. So to think back on your good deeds and to celebrate them um they they have a good deeds have a good result and you shouldn't be shy about the experience of this this is called happiness why would you not want to be happy <laughs> and and then you also have memories of good deeds which encourage you to do more good deeds so that you can exalt and enjoy your good deeds you don't necessarily have to boast about them but you there's no problem with telling other people about good deeds because they also then have an opportunity to rejoice in that, celebrate your good deeds. We like to hear about good deeds, don't we? Somebody saves, you know, dives into a canal and rescues a child or something like that. We, we, we really rejoice. We, we're so, say, Thank you very much. That wonderful. How how wonderful. Now that person may not want to maybe report in the news about it or you know have everybody in the world hear about it. But it would be a shame if they kept it all to themselves and we never heard about it. Because we like to. It inspire. It uplifts us and inspires us and instructs us. So, um, and then that person can think about. Yeah, that was. I put myself at risk there, and it was it was worth it. I I felt like I, I had to do that. So this is part of the psychology Buddhist psychology is uh, the approach to having done good deeds and to reflect on those good deeds. Okay, next question. Next question is from Upasaka Elaine from Hillcrest, Alberta, Canada. Dear Venerable, in reference to MN 77.13, the Greater Discourse on Sukulia Dayin, the mind-made body, my question is this, what is the significance of a mind-made body? What is the Buddha trying to tell us? Does it relate to the mind's influence over feelings in the body? What is this second body he refers to as, quote, pulling a sword from a scabbard? Yeah, we've talked about this uh, a few times in these Q and A's, and this would be the term, which strangely enough was almost absent in uh, the Western world before about 1950. <laughs> is out of body experience, and maybe the astral body. So this, this, uh, there's some sort of mind-made body that can be taken out of the world, out of body experience. Uh, this is a, this was a terminology that had to be invented. I think it was late 1950s. I, for, I think it was Robert Monroe or somebody that, that just this kind of ordinary business guy, inventor business guy, blundered into this experience of going out of his body. He was having a nap on a couch in the afternoon and seemed to go out of his body and become lucid and, and see things, you know, at a distance that he could later on verify. And it shocked him so much that he wondered if he could learn how to, you know, make it more, 
more precise. And, and out of this came a few books and, and then an interest in this, even by the American military was interested in remote viewing and all this kind of stuff. So this is part of um, certainly Buddhist, uh, Buddhist practices and it, it is mostly attained through meditation you become much more aware of. It, it's not a, it's not, it doesn't happen to everybody, even enlightened people, uh, even with deep samadhi. Uh, not all of them are able to do this, but some seem to be able to do this to depart from their body with, a, with an astral body, uh, some sort of psychic mind-made body that actually has senses and can go and see things and experience things in it at a distance. So this is this is the report of this. This is what it what it is. You know this this might some this may occur to people, and they might attribute it to a dream. So uh, you see in shamanic cultures where the shaman also is gifted with being able to see things at a distance and so forth. And this seems to be a process of this. Sometimes they use various drugs and spells and chanting and stuff to put them in, into a trance in order to be able to do this. So I think that sometimes ordinary people have dreams they, that they attribute to dreams, but they might be out of body in the, instead of just dreaming that they're actually seeing things at a, at a distance. But they, if they're in a culture that doesn't have any information about this, or they, it never occurred to them that it, that it could have been a partially, a partially real experience, they won't, they'll just attribute it to a dream. People in dreams, sometimes they have predictive dreams or they have a visitation uh, by somebody. Somebody dies that's close to them at a distance, you know, and then they, in the dream, they that person visits them and so forth. And it turns out later that, by gosh, it was a, a kind of a real, a verifiable experience. So this is, um, this is explored in... Uh, parapsychology studies. Um, I would say that there's kind of a hardcore science uh, skepticism about this. Some scientists, some sort of hardcore phys physical sciences would deny that this could happen. They, they, why they say that is that they you're, you're trapped in inside your skull. Your your mind is is your brain, and it's not going anywhere. <laughs> uh, but seems to be a huge body of of actual scientifically structured studies that show that it's it's a very plausible event, which changes the definition of what the mind is in relationship to the body. If you're a hardcore skeptic, then you're just going to, you're not even going to look at those studies. You're not going to look at evidence for this because theoretically it can't happen. Uh, but there's people with PhDs that know the scientific method and in controlled situations come up with um, evidence that this does happen. One of the things that, you know, I've, I've read many, many of these uh, accounts over the period. I've been interested in this for many years. And of course, as a monk, this kind of thing is very commonly reported in terms of the meditation monks and so forth. So uh, I think the key to these experiments that that the hardcore science uh, attempted to just to verify this through hardcore science needs to work more with talented people. Like this is not something that everybody can do. You, you shouldn't try to verify it through that. 
there are certain people that, that can do this. There's a number of things that only a few people can do that we shouldn't dismiss the, that it's impossible. I was watching a little clip on a, on a Canadian girl, a teenage girl that has absolute memory. And this is, she's, you know, 15 years old. She lives in Ottawa and she has full recall of every single day of her life and the, all the events you, to the minute, uh, everything, every, and there, at first people doubted that this was possible, but you see records of this a little in, occasionally in history. And then there were thought to be about six people. Now they think, as this becomes more known, they think there's so far about a hundred people that can do this. Uh, can think about that absolute memory. Everything you ever read, every di everything she's ever listened to on television, she can repeat the the dialogue from every program. She's she'll tell you what the next line is on everything she's heard and read. And this is the case for cer certain people. It's a mind blower, isn't it? Yeah. How many of you can remember what you had for breakfast yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> or even this morning? <laughs> so this is extraordinary. And you, if you want to study that, you don't just study anybody. You study just those people who are manifesting that. There's people who have spontaneous uh, mathematical capacities and also musical abilities. You see these people who can hear something once and repeat the, th the entire thing. It's staggering. It's uh, also people with uh, what are called absolute pitch. So they don't need a cue from an instrument or anything to know every note that's being played. So there are people with the certain uh, psychic gifts uh, and I shouldn't use the word gift. Uh, it's not a gift from God. It's uh, some sort of development over time uh, from a previous from previous lives that manifest. So they should study exclusively those people, try to find those people. Now, one of the problems uh, in studying this is that uh, I would say your best bet for this is are monks. Uh, meditation monks. Not all not all monks are meditation monks, and even amongst those who are meditation monks, not a, not all of them are have these side side, side effects, uh, psychic capacities. And then there's another problem: is that monks are not allowed to disclose those types of abilities to lay people. So when you ask to study. If a, if a scientist comes to ask to study monks for these capacities, then the monks would not want to participate in that because they're not supposed to disclose any supernormal capacities to lay people. They can disclose it to, I can see things happening at a distance, and then the next day I find out that that thing happened. And then that, that the monk they're talking to will probably have a reputation for, for that capacity. And then they will say, yes, that's how it's done. And this is how you can improve on that, et cetera. So that, ta that field of supernormal capacity is, unfortunately, is not available for too much scientific study by lay people, maybe monks themselves. And if, if monks study it and report it, report other monks' capacities, even anonymously, then, then a lot of people will say, well, that, I, I need to confirm it myself. You're you're biased because you're you're a monk. You want this to happen, etc. So uh, there's all kinds of impediments to this. We're living in a, a extraordinarily skeptical time regarding these capacities. Earlier in history, both in the West and the East, these these kind of reports were were accepted as at face value. There are all kinds of you know your, your uncle or your aunt or your grandmother or somebody had this had the power. You know had the had the gift, you know, <laughs> could see things. And, and this was just thought, oh yeah, of course. Aboriginal societies have this, the shamanic societies have this, uh, uh, full reports in uh, Catholic saintly tradition, the contemplative practitioners, and many reports of this kind of uh, psychic capacities. Uh, 
and and only in since the say the nineteenth century ha, has great deal of skepticism being brought to this because there's a certain bias towards materialism, uh, uh, physicalism, as we call it, and uh, another type of philosophy called positivism, which is uh, a philosophy of scientific materialism. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Next question from the live chat is from Arvind in Seattle, United States. Dear Ajahn Sona, the Buddhist scriptures are vast in length and number. What, in your view, is the most lucid and concise single-volume compilation of the suttas in English? Well, as a general approach, you first look at, say, Bhikkhu Bodhi's The Noble Eightfold Path. That's where it all starts. And then there are a few sort of compendiums of the basic teachings. One is called uh, The Buddha and His Teachings by Venerable Narada. I think it's released by the, the Buddhist Publication Society, BPS. Uh, another one that's quite nice is uh, by Venerable Nyanaponika, the, the heart of Buddhist meditation. And there's another one by him. Do you remember the name? Um, you, you remembered it before, yes. Okay. So... A vision of Dhamma. A vision of Dhamma. The vision of Dhamma. The vision of Dhamma. Nyanaponika. There are a number of little collections by Bhikkhu Bodhi as well of the numbered sayings and so forth. I think he has a... Yeah, look, Bhikkhu Bodhi is, is a great source for this kind of sutta type of compendiums. So try just looking up Bhikkhu Bodhi, and then you'll see all of the books by him. And, and so I recommend virtually everything he's, he's uh, published. Yeah. Next question from the live chat is from Chris. I'm wondering what the allowables are after noon each day and how much one can consume. I'm trying to hold to eight precepts, but not eating after noon is difficult for me. Yeah, if you're in the household life, um, it is a difficult thing to keep up because everybody else is ha enjoying dinner and you're the lonely outsider off in your bedroom trying to avoid the smells of, of chili con carne and <laughs> tacos <laughs> and steaks. Uh, so, yeah, there is allowables. Uh, any types of fruit juice are allowable. Sh anything, uh, any kind of sugars, oil, sugar and oil are allowable. Um, although it's not, you know, a spoonful of vegetable oil is not all that inviting. Uh, you can have butter, yeah. And you can make like sort of candies, like out of butter and sugar. Uh, yeah, you can have coffee as well, coffee and tea. So you can have coffee with butter and sugar in it. <laughs> and uh, miso is allowable, like uh, bean broth is allowable. Um, and cheese is allowable. Some, some monks are strict. They don't think cheese is allowable, but butter is. Mm -hmm. So just cheese, but you can't have it on a cracker. Mm -hmm. So, and I think gummy bears are all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's quite a little, you know, it's to stave off, you know, uncomfortable feelings of pain. It's not just for amusement though. It's like, do I need this? Do I want this? Now, if you're doing physical labor, then it's really not... Eight precepts is probably not appropriate for you. Uh, monks have to do the eight precepts, and they, they're restricted to these allowables. Um, 
in the afternoon. And uh, But there are lots of monks that don't take the, the allowables. I, I virtually never have allowables. In the, I just have water in the afternoon. But um, m I, I guess most monks take a little... You know, some of the, sometimes the monks are involved in work projects as well around the monastery where they have to do a bit of carpentry or hauling things around or lifting things and helping build things. So they're, they're, they're using up a lot of calories and they, they need a little bit of sort of medicinal, medicinal food in the afternoon. But uh, it's restricted in, to, in what can be eaten. So yeah, the, the five uh, are basically um, all kinds of pure sugars, honey, maple syrup, that kind of stuff. Uh, oils and, and butter are allowable. And uh, fruit juices, strained fruit juices, without the pulp, any kind of fruit juice is allowable. Yeah. Okay. Next question from the live chat is from No One Everyone in Iran. Dear Ajahn Sona, if the world is truly infinite, without beginning or end, according to my, many commentaries, such as the Buddha Gosas, then it can be inferred that time is only an illusion, and every possibility that could ever manifest in any shape and form and place and time has already happened, which is ultimately deterministic. What is your take on this, Venerable Sir? Well, that's one of the questions the Buddha set aside is the universe eternal or not? Uh, he said, don't spend much time thinking about that. In fact, better off not to think about it at all because you're not going to get an answer. And notice in modern astrophysics that they, they you know, can have opinions on both sides, but n there isn't any final conclusion. We have this idea of the Big Bang, uh, but then the question is what, what banged, you know, um, was there, was this a result of previous universe? Um, and it's not a settled question in any way. And, and the Buddha is 2,500 years ago and saying, you're not going to settle this one. It's outside of, you can't think about eternity. You can't think about infinity. And then something arising out of nothing, appearing out of nothing, is also violates our sense of causality. So those two possibilities are fruitless uh, thought patterns. So you set, set aside about the infinity of the universe in time and in space. Is it infinite or not in time and space? He said, forget about that. And then go on to uh, consider what in the, the limited time you have in this life, what would you like to accomplish? What is the most profitable goal and that he says it is the undoing of uh, unnecessary suffering so this is the, your um, your priority in life so you gotta figure uh, pe there are a lot of smart people out there and we they would re register very high on IQ test uh, and then there's this other thing called wisdom so what is the difference between wisdom and intelligence wisdom is uh, so intelligence is, is the ability to solve problems. But wisdom is the ability to choose which problem to solve. So people fiddle their lives away with mathematics or uh, all kinds of incredible, um, pro pro you know, uh, processes that they build cal palaces and so forth. Uh, is this really the best use of your time? Wisdom tells you, what is the best use of my intelligence? What should I direct my intelligence to? And this is to solve the problem of suffering. So uh, again, and people often, the projects they take on are really just existential ways of passing the time. They decide to read the Encyclopedia Britannica or uh, they do game shows or, you know, uh, play chess, you know, uh, somewhat of a waste of time, uh, your precious time. Uh, it's amusing, 
It's, it's engaging, but really, is it the best use of your time? Even though it might require a very high IQ, to, the fact that it's pro, in, intelligence processing is not, not, hasn't cracked the nut of the, 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 the problem of life, which is what are you supposed to be doing with your intelligence? Uh, so yeah, abandon those uh, those kind of questions. That's very philosophical of you, but it's uh, again that's the difference between Western and Eastern philosophy. The Buddha says, uh, by the way, you know we know about those questions about the universe, eternal, how many this and that, deterministic. Forget about it. Get on with the real issue here. Get on with solving the problem of suffering. <laughs> okay, next problem. <laughs> Next question is from Roth in India. I'm sorry. Let me start over. From Roth in Lima, Peru. Dear Ajahn, I enjoyed your metaphor of mindfulness as a sentry and it allowing samatha and vipassana to enter. Would you say that each resides more prominently in either hemisphere of the brain? If so, how could we use this knowledge to improve our meditation in accessing these states? Yeah, so... Raf, is it? R-A-F. R-A-F, Raf. Is bringing up this idea of hemispheres of the brain, which is a very, very interesting area. Um, I recommend the, the sort of the, the leading voice in this area at the moment is Ian McGilchrist, a psychiatrist who has written a couple of very large interesting books. One is called The Master and His Emissary, and uh, which is about 600 pages long or 700 pages long. And uh, his last book, written eight years later, right, he just published uh, a couple of years ago, is called The Matter with Things. And it's about 1,500 pages long, <laughs> two volumes. It is a complete in-depth exploration of the function of the two hemispheres, how it affects the way we think. And what it is, not merely a, like a psychiatric text on brain damage or something. What it is, is a, is a kind of a warning that the present society that we have, especially the technical society in the West and technical and scientific society is characteristic of left hemisphere product. And the left hemisphere is missing a lot. It's the, the left hemisphere is the one that sees the trees the right hemisphere is the one that sees the forest. And uh, so this is, and in fact, when we log the Amazon or half the, the continent of North America, when we eat each tree, the, the logger just sees a tree and he cuts that tree down, what's the big deal? But there's more to it than that. There's endless interactions and repercussions of removing all of these trees a forest is removed and that forest has interactions with people and animals and the atmosphere and each tree has an interaction with each itself. So it's, it's not something that's just about cutting into two by fours or planks or cubic meters of firewood. There's another element which the right hemisphere is much more able to deal with. It's the holistic, interactive, and the value side of things. So the, he's warning that the left hemisphere is running the world. Um, and that the left, left hemisphere has its function, it has to benefit us. It has to, does it have humanity to it? Does it have compassion to it? Does it have the joy of, the, of art and music and so forth? So that, these are the hemispheric functions. So these, this samatha and vipassana, samatha meaning serenity or like 
lucid clarity and stillness. And then there's vipassana, which is meaning heightened uh, insight, uh, clear seeing. These are cooperative. You, you'll hear about vipassana centers and vipassana meditation. And then you hear about samatha. And sometimes uh, these become schools where samatha dismisses vipassana activities and vipassana uh, dismiss samatha. Uh, but the, it's very clear from the Buddha's stories that these are, these are two features which should not be separated. They, they just become hyphenated. So you do samatha vipassana. You don't just do vipassana and you don't just do samatha. You do samatha vipassana. Uh, deep uh, ability to pay attention and then to gain clarity and insight with the with this enhanced uh, uh, focusing of the of the mind. So it's like the samatha is like uh, binoculars that are uh, you have to learn to focus the binoculars. They're they're no good to you if they're not focused, and you can't see properly. But just to focus the binoculars, just to see, you don't just scan randomly. You're, you're looking for something with those binoculars. What are you, you, you're looking for something very specific with those binoculars. And that, that something that you're looking for is, is uh, the key to, your, to the undoing of suffering. So you know, the binoculars and the focusing them are very, very important. And there's a, it's quite an amazing sight when you, when you do focus binoculars, it's, it's joyful. It's, people exclaim, wow, <laughs> the binoculars come or this, the, the uh, telescope comes into focus and people say, wow. And then now you have to say, okay, say, what is it? What, what can we learn about these stars and the moon and so forth by, by seeing clearly? What, now what, can we, what are we seeing and how can we understand this? So this is the, the function of these. So the, the two hemispheres have to come together to cooperate. And, but basically the left hemisphere is the, is the servant and the right hemisphere is the master and the left hemisphere should not take over the kingdom and run the run the show. So we need a rich uh, combination of both hemispheres. So uh, yeah, I I, th I found it profitable to read uh, Ian McGilchrist's both of those books, the Master and His Emissary, and the the Matter with Things. It's a very acute examination of things. And it, it has a huge effect on when the, the left hemisphere is dominant and, it, and you don't know about anything else, you, you will have emotional uh, problems. Uh, depression and emptiness and meaninglessness will come from overuse of left hemisphere and the absence of the meaningfulness structures of, that the right hemisphere can can uh, provide. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more question here. Yes. The final question today is from Mudita in Sundry, Alberta. Since my health challenges, I have found great peace with the devas. Any feedback? Yeah, the devas are part of uh, one of the recommendations that the Buddha is to do what's called deva nusati. Now, devas are what we might in, what call angelic beings, beings who are dwelling in the heavens. Uh, heavens meaning not just the sky, but uh, um, ideal conditions, beautiful conditions. In in Christianity, they don't don't really have any idea of where these angelic beings came from, they sort of generated by God or something. But in Buddhism, we say, well, <laughs> they're, the devas are just beings that perhaps were once human that were practicing the morality and generosity and kindness 
And the result is that at death, the consciousness is very purified and it, it takes rebirth in these heavenly realms. And so one can contemplate one's own deva nature. So deva nusati is mindfulness of uh, the, the goodness, you know, the, the pr production of goodness and, and goodness in beings and including your own, your own goodness, your own deva nature, your own angelic nature. You contemplate and cultivate your own angelic nature. Mm -hmm. You also want to, to be light and free and full of, full of ease. Uh, there's, that's where beauty is found. So the beautiful is, is found in, in goodness and morality and generosity. That's, that is beautiful. We see that. I mean, some people can't recognize it, but others, it's like some people can't recognize beautiful music or beautiful art. But even the animals can recognize, uh, you know, beauty, uh, uh, a good heart in, a, in people. And eventually the, the animals become very attached to a person who's very kind and uh, considerate of them and so far, the uh, basic it's a basic recognition. Also, people are attracted to to good people uh, that are kindly and generous and so forth. So, this is the how how and these angelic beings, the devas, are are produced, and one can bring them to mind. And in fact, if you practice your loving kindness enough, then eventually uh, you may may catch glimpses of this deva realm in your dreams uh, and maybe even in your meditation, you may start to see into these realms of beauty. Yeah. So we will, uh, that's a, a good note to end on, isn't it? Um, we will see you next week.